community at ASAE. So we're very, very excited to be here. Um, as Heidi mentioned, I'm the chair of the Young Professionals Advisory Committee at ASAE, and I would love to welcome all of you here. I would like to introduce our panelists and then also introduce the agenda for this evening. Uh, so first, I want to introduce uh, Nate Wombold, CMP, Director of Meetings and Conferences at the American Anthropological Association. Lori Granich, MBA, RDN, CAE, Director of Lifelong Learning and Engagement at the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Sarah Bustard, Membership Director of Alpha Omega International Dental Fraternity. And Greg Melia, CAE, CEO of the Customer Experience Professionals Association. So welcome to all the panelists and thank you for being here. Uh, today, in a lot of our preparations, we decided to break up the panelists uh, based on um, very specific criteria. And I wanted to just run through them so you can really understand the expertise behind each, each of, the, uh, of the panelists. So we're going to talk a few factors, the human factor, the tech factor, the remote factor, and sort of a CEO uh, level factor. When we're talking about what does all this COVID remote work, is it everything that a millennial was, was asking for in terms of what they wanted in a, in a remote uh, opportunity, and whether or not it's, it's the ideal. Uh, there's nothing that can be compared to what we're going through right now. So uh, it's really important for us to take the positives and then look to the future. So in our human factor, we're going to talk about what COVID has taught us about the humanity of our coworkers and how that leads to changing our work expectations and how we remember and integrate what we go back to. Our tech factor will talk about how COVID has taught us about the tools that are available and how these tools can change and affect processes and systems that enable us to do our job and what can we use when we go back, if anything. And then we're gonna talk remote, which is how, how did COVID uh, teach us anything about uh, being able and ready uh, other, like with others and how unlike it might be to what you're currently uh, used to and what environment that is like. And so we're gonna talk to someone that's already been working remotely and what it is like to be remote now. And then we'll have a CEO who works remotely and manages a remote staff and uh, their perspective on, on, on managing staff in an association and managing member expectations. And so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to the panelists. Each of them are gonna uh, speak for about five minutes on their topic, and then we'll open it up for a true town hall dialogue where everybody can be engaged with our panelists. Uh, so first I'm gonna talk, I'm going to pass it off to Nate Wombold for our human factor, Nate. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for being with us today, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate your time. We're also really excited to talk to all of you from the YP, the Young Perspective, uh, excuse me, the Young Professional Perspective uh, within ASAE. A little bit about me, uh, I manage teams of meetings professionals and I have uh, for the past seven or eight years within the association space. A lot of my staff, people who have worked for me in the past, people who work for me now, say that my management style really focuses on understanding that all of my staff and my colleagues are people before they are employees. And I think COVID really made that crystal clear for all of us. When we're working remotely and when we work in an office, a lot of things are different and there are some things that are the same. But I think what COVID did was shine a really bright light on how we have to come to understand each other first as human beings before we can understand each other as coworkers or subordinates um, within a work environment. So the first thing I wanna talk about is about expectation setting. Expectation setting in, an, in a remote environment can look very differently than it does in an in-person or office setting. I think it's really important that we're clear with the communication that we use and the channels of communication that work best for each of us. What I've learned in my remote environment is that some of my employees like to text me, some of my employees like to send Windows messages or Teams messages, some stick with email and others still need to pick up the phone and call. A lot of my employees like to see face-to-face -face contact. It reminds them of that office space that we came from, while others really don't want to turn on their webcams. So I think it's really important to have these conversations candidly and understand that what's right for one person isn't necessarily going to be right for someone else. And then also communicate effectively through those channels based on the channels that your partners, your your collaborators, your direct reports, your bosses all prefer. The next thing I want to talk about <clears throat> is patience and grace. 
if you're in an office environment and you walk down the hallway to one of your colleagues' offices to ask them a question and they're not in their office, you simply return to your desk and then you come back a little later on and you try again. In a remote environment, sometimes there's this understanding or expectation that we're all constantly in front of our computers at all times. And if we're not in front of our computers, when someone sends us a message or tries to Teams call us, that somehow, somewhere, someone thinks we're doing something we're not supposed to. We're outside, we're not working, we're taking the day off. When really we could have gotten up to get a drink of water, we could be going to the bathroom, we could be attending to a kid or a spouse or a dog. It's really no different than not being in your office for that moment when someone stops by. So reframing how we re work remotely and giving each other the grace and the freedom to do the very same things in a remote environment that we do in an office setting really helps level the playing field and make people feel comfortable and trusted and valued in the work that they're doing. The last thing I want to talk about is specifically how this remote environment has changed the human factor for YPs. A lot of our employers, a lot of our bosses, a lot of our colleagues who are not young professionals look to us to set examples of how to operate in the future. As, as Tom said, a lot of us have always wanted this. We've wanted remote work. We've wanted flexible work schedules. We've wanted to be able to set our own uh, priorities and our deadlines and timelines. And now that we have it, a lot of our colleagues and people at work are looking to us to set the example and to answer questions and how to. It's really important that we remember these tech factors, excuse me, these human factors when we're reporting back to our colleagues to make sure that we always remember that we're people first and employees second. In a remote environment, that's actually what sustains the work we do, especially in a crisis like the pandemic we're all experiencing. But when the pandemic disappears and the emergency disappears, the work we're doing remotely can still proceed the exact same way, as long as we remember to engage with one another in personalized ways that that pay special attention to and cater to each individual's needs. Thank you, Nate. I find, I find it interesting that um, we're talking very much about culture and that we want our staff to be part of our culture and, and, and contribute to the culture. And that's something that I think a lot of companies are finally and organizations are getting on board to doing in person and how important it is to maintain that remotely also. And so I, I do like that. I like that point. And I, I do hope that that's something that does uh, maintain in some way or one way or another. Uh, so thank you, Nate. Uh, we're going to move on to the tech factor. What, what programs are working? What technology is working? Um, how is everyone staying connected? So Lori, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Um, so one disclosure here is that I work at a company that's had a pretty robust telecommuting program for a few years now. Um, so we've really been able to leverage this during the pandemic. You know, I'm in Chicago. We've been in lockdown since about March 16th, um, but prior to that, about 88% of our employees could work from home at least in some capacity. So, you know, most people work from home, you know, one to two days per week. Um, and I know Sarah will dive more into that, and I don't want to step on her toes, but I just wanted to give you some context there. So, you know, COVID-19 proved that we were digitally ready. Um, so we pretty much were able to continue business as usual for the most part. Um, you know, since we already had the infrastructure in place, we were able to quickly pivot to provide critical information to our members. Um, I will say we weren't able to meet capacity at first. Um, you know, the hunger for the COVID information was so great that we did have to upgrade some of our systems, especially when um, delivering education. Um, and my second disclosure, disclosure is that I manage a team of millennials. So um, going back to saying that we were digitally ready, I think it's important to note that I work on the education team. So again, we deliver virtual education all the time. We're really comfortable with um, certain tech platforms. Um, so again, we've been able to make that quick pivot, but I don't think that that's true for everyone in our organization. Um, and I feel remote work has really forced people to um, really take the plunge when it comes to new technology. You know, I think nobody in this time wants to be replaceable. Um, and it's such an unknown environment that we're kind of all eager to prove our worth. So, you know, like being tech incompetent isn't an excuse, I guess, anymore. So um, and now it's truly affecting job performance. 
Um, so we really use this time to train other departments. Um, obviously, you guys all know the demand in virtual meetings has skyrocketed and we hold over 150 meetings a year. So we really had no choice but to get everyone on board. Um, so some platforms we use for communication and collaboration. The first one is WebEx Teams. Um, and our team used this a lot before COVID. We use it for chat and now we use it for video conferencing. Um, and to speak about video conferencing, speaking from a millennial um, perspective, we hated it. <laughs> so we kind of felt like if I get to work from home, I don't want to get ready. Um, but that has completely changed. Um, just even a few days ago, we were on a large conference call that didn't have a video. And it was like terribly unorganized. Everyone's talking over each other. So we feel like we can't believe we become these people. But I really think video is here to stay. Um, uh, I do want to state personally that I kind of find it hard to read a crowd when presenting virtually. Um, I gave a really big presentation to our executive team yesterday and you know when that when there's silence you're kind of like are they paying attention like are you muted you know you, you don't really know what's going on there so I do think um, at least having the video on helps read facial expressions and give you some visual clues. Um, but going back to chat, I think chat is one of the most, you know, useful features, at least in this whole work from home transition. It's really helped me check on my team, um, get answers quickly without really, you know, clogging up their inboxes. You can screenshot, you can share documents. Um, literally, we have entire conversations just using GIFs and it, it works. <laughs> so um, one warning, though, is that you can see when you're on versus when you're idle. And I think that's really um, contributing to some of this burnout or this feeling like you constantly have to be on, like what Nate was talking about. Um, something else we use is Cisco Jabber. This has replaced our desk phones. It's a VoIP application. Um, so it also has a chat feature. And then something, another platform we use is Microsoft Teams. It's really um, gaining traction. And this is used to, um, for video conferencing, for workflows, and for chats. And a lot of our vendors use it. So it's really nice to just like quickly jump on a video call with them. But if you've been counting, that's three platforms that I said we use for chat. And it can get so overwhelming. Even right now, I don't know if you heard it. My chat is, is going off, even though I swear I turned it off. Um, but it can get pretty distracting. And you, know, you really want to make sure that you're able to focus on your projects as well. Um, and I'll wrap up here quickly, but I did ask my team um, for this town hall, I asked them what is the biggest issues that you're struggling with working from home. Um, and the two were loneliness and not being able to unplug. And you know, going into this, I was really concerned about the employees that I have that, um, you know, have young children at home, especially when the school started to close. But I think as this pandemic has gone on, and I don't think any of us thought that we'd be working from home this long, I'm definitely much more concerned about the people who live alone. Um, and I have a lot of those on my team. So I think that chat function and quickly being able to hop on a video with them is super helpful. Um, something else uh, to mention is that most of those apps or the technology that I just mentioned all have apps. And of course, I've downloaded it to my phone. So constantly connected, which I think, again, is playing into some issues. And I think we can get into a real big discussion about that later. Um, but really, when all is said and done, I think we have improved our communication. I think collaboration is at an all time high. Um, it's really forced us to take a hard look at the way we do things and what really needs to be done in person versus what can be done online. Thanks, Lori. I mean, there's so much there to, to really touch on. I, I, a couple of people in the chat are already talking about um, their, their experiences in loneliness and always being available um, and reachable, unfortunately. Um, you can't even say, um, I'm out of the store, maybe the store, but you can't say you're out with friends or really anything else. So um, there's definitely some, some chatter about that, which we'll discuss later. Um, but one, th one thing someone asked is if you can put all the, the platforms you're using in the chat so that they, oh, I, sure. I, I wrote Microsoft Teams, WebEx Teams, and Jabber, but if you, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, sure. I I'll write them in there right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I'm muted. We are going to move on to our remote pro. So Sarah Bustard, she has already been working remotely for a few years, and now she's uh, working remotely during COVID, which is a different experience. So Sarah, take it away. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so I, a little bit of my background is I work for an international association with members spanning over 10 different countries and numerous time zones. So I 
I'm working on meetings, sometimes nine o'clock at night, uh, sometimes weekend mornings. So working remote um, really has been a great help for at that aspect. Um, on top of that, I work with dentists who are seeing patients from nine to five. So I can't get on the call a call with them sometimes. So if I have a night where I know that I'm going to be talking to um, a group of my dentists, I'm working remotely makes it so much easier to flex, to be flexible and you know, maybe flex some hours later in the week and has really been huge for my work-life balance uh, to be able to do that. Um, another thing that I find beneficial um, is that not only do I work remote, but I work for a very small staff association. So I'm very lucky that I have an excellent mentor and my supervisor, and she has encouraged me to get involved with ASAE and um, being a part of things like Next Gen and being on the Membership Advisory Council has really helped me um, connect with people and connect with um, and, and network with people, um, have conversations and learn things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So that's been a source of great information for me as a remote employee. Um, one thing that I wanted to touch is a question that I get a lot, probably the question I get the most um, when I tell people I work remotely and it kind of stems a little bit from uh, what Nate mentioned about, you know, popping into people's office and, you know, talking to your coworkers and a question I got is, don't you miss that? What's like, you know, what's it like not to be able to just walk down the hall and say, hey, what's up? And have someone check your work and proofread things. Um, I, there, there is an aspect that I'm, you know, I miss sometimes being able to talk to people, but a big thing um, that I've noticed working remotely is the quality of my work has improved and I'm more confident in my work that I am putting out to my members because I am not leaning on other people to proof read my work and ask their opinions and um, I'm able to fully look at my work and think to myself, okay, what would my teammates say about this? Or what would the marketing department say about this? Or what would my supervisor say about this? And I'm able to think about that now. And I've really developed that skill um, to be able to do that and produce a better quality work. Um, I'm not saying that I never shoot anything off to pr be proofread and for questions because I do that very often, um, but I've really learned to differentiate what work I need to have proofread and looked over and what I can just produce on my own and I have the confidence to send it out to my members. Um, so how I view it. Um, looking at working remotely right now, um, I'd really like to say it's it's completely a different ball game. It's it's very different. Um, if you think about your own situation, um, I mean, people. It's it's just a very stressful time right now during. Um, during COVID-19, just worrying about your own health, worrying about friends, family. Um, you have your family at home, you have your children at home, partners at home. Um, it's a whole different work experience. And thinking about if this is your first time working 
from home and you're using this to base your thoughts and ideas about what remote work is, um, I would I would really encourage you not to do that because right now um, it's very different than what a typical remote situation is like. So what you're saying is this is probably not the best example, right? It's Correct. Yeah, and not not just for um, for yourself personally, but for your association, there are many associations who, if they haven't had remote workers uh, set up in the past, they basically had to, at a drop of a hat, make it possible for all their workers, which means <laughs> they had to form a plan almost overnight immediately. The, your IT department had to make it possible for every employee to be able to work from home. So um, there's so many different aspects um, to think about as to why it's not a typical situation. Right, and that's why, that's why we're here to talk about how, how that, what that future looks like. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, you know, I think people, you know, I'm sure people come up to you and say, you're so lucky that you work remotely, right? Uh, and so I, hear I hear that a lot. Right, and it's what does that mean, right? What is that, you know, what don't they know? Because it's not all, all roses. I'm gonna move on to Greg, so we're right on time here. Um, Greg is our remote CEO, among many other hats I'm sure he wears, um, but Greg, why don't you go ahead? Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, half of my team was remote uh, prior to uh, the lockdown and uh, working home, and now the entire team is, is uh, remote. Uh, I think as CEOs, it's really impo uh, imperative that we ensure a comfortable and engaging culture. And that has, you know, some things that we need to think about as department leaders and um, CEOs and, and such, which is to encourage people to be able to have small talk and, and make that small talk relevant to all levels of the organization. You know, so try to choose things like pets that uh, everybody might be able to, uh, you know, talk about rather than challenges that people might be facing on homeschooling, which not everyone can, can relate to. Uh, and make sure that you create a opportunity for everyone to have a voice at, at the table. And it's not just the opportunity. You know, as a CEO, I, I make a really large point in making sure that I call on the YPs on my staff, you know, to ask their perspective and their experience and, and, and their reaction and feelings. You know, I think that that word's really more important now than in the past. How do you feel about this? Um, and that's because we have to really increase our focus on the human elements of our team and our, our uh, and our members as well, the people who volunteer with you especially. Listen to the energy level of their voice uh, and consider the timing uh, of what you're asking uh, of your coworkers. You know, think about whether you're going to send a request to somebody at the very end of the day or first thing in the morning. You know, uh, you wouldn't walk up to somebody in the hallway and ask them where a report was. Why do you feel good about shooting that off as an email? <laughs> you know, think about, you know, how that comes uh, together. Um, it's really important to take breaks. And it's really important that we say to one another, you know, why don't you take a break? You know, uh, you know, when's the last time you went for a walk? You know, have you been out in the sunshine? Um, that's something that as, as leaders, it will pay a dividend, you know, for our team if they get out and, and they do that. But probably the most important thing that we can do as a, as a CEO or a department leader is to regularly communicate and consistently about the desired outcomes that we want. And that means saying what the priorities are, what's important this week and next week, and what's less important. I mean, it's, it's really important that people know that they can put some things aside or that they have the control over their schedule uh, so that they don't have to um, try to, to, to meet, be Superman or Superwoman and complete everything during the day. Uh, I think it's important that we work as teams to leverage the work that we're doing. So that if one person writes a blog post, we're sharing it on social media, or it's feeding into our newsletter, or it's going into an educational program. That way we can still deliver a lot of value for our members, 
because our members are having incredibly divided attention right now. So sending one thing out into the ether is, is likely to, to miss and, and not get noticed. Something I'd encourage everybody to think about is their own professional development you know, in these times. Uh, and for managers and CEOs, how do you encourage your young professionals and, and colleagues to make choices? You know, don't require them to go to a, a webinar, give them the choice to um, build their skills and, and look forward. Uh, and then most of all, take time to stop and, and celebrate and recognize and appreciate. Uh, almost every call that, that I have now is ending with the phrase, I appreciate you. Uh, and you know that's something that I think we need to say to one another. Um, focus on appreciation, focus on energy, uh, and uh, you know let people know you appreciate them and ask what you can do to help make their their job easier. That's that's to me what will make working remotely uh, tremendously successful, whether it's during the pandemic or, or after. Right. Well, it goes without saying, Greg. I appreciate you. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you too. <laughs> but I, you know, one thing that really stands out to me is culture, voice, and appreciation. It goes a long way anywhere in life. And we forget that it could be so productive at work. And even now, when there's no human, to, you know, there's no in person contact, how important is it to say that on a video or even in an email? Um, because it really does go a long way. Because if we feel like we're just cogs in a wheel, it does make a difference. So I really appreciate that. Greg, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question because I know in our preparation here, we talked about the focusing on the expectation for our members versus just our staff and what our members are supposed to expect both in when you're working remotely in a normal state of affairs versus in, in COVID. You know, we, we're, always, we're trying to say, you know, you pay dues. We don't want to show any, we want we show the smooth transition of services. Um, but we're all experiencing it together. So can you just speak a little bit to that, the expectation piece? Yeah, you know, I think that um, our, our members want to make sure that they feel hurt, uh, you know, and so I think that that's, that's an important part for us to make sure that we let people know that we received a message from them or that we're, you know, working hard on, on their behalf. Our members are just as human as we are. You know, so they're also struggling with um, the same challenges of, of loneliness and um, divided attention and, and all the rest. So I, I like the thought that we need to use grace, you know, uh, uh, in with them as well. But I think it's also very fair and very important for us each as, you know, staff and um, department leaders uh, to make sure that our members recognize that, you um, we need to manage our time and energy, you know, and our flow through as well. Um, there are a number of emails that, you know, I've sent to somebody and, and I'll say, you know, on one side, sometimes I'll say, um, I appreciate that you sent this. Uh, I'll have a response to you, but I won't be able to get to it this week. Um, on the other side, sometimes I'll wait and respond to a, a, an email 36 hours after I get it and I'll say, I apologize for the delay. I needed to gather some information to give you a full response. Um, you know, what I think is, uh, is challenging for everybody is if you um, don't live a set of core values. It, you know, so if people don't feel appreciated or they don't understand that you're working on their behalf, that, that's when you fall short. Thank you, Greg. There we're ready to open this up to, to everyone. I have two questions in the Q&A, but the chat is quite busy. Um, I, I need to just agree with the office chair. How many of us are having lower back problems now that we're not in our office chairs and in you know, some folding metal chair or wherever we are? Um, you know, workspace, how important workspace is, um, is, separating it from work and living space given that we're all home. Um, I live in upstate New York where my house is just as expensive as an apartment in DC. So I have space, but many of you probably don't have nearly as much space to carve out an office. Um, so that is something I, I, I will want to ask the panelists, especially Sarah, you know, given that you're working remotely, I know Laura, you do too. What do you do with your office space at home and how do you, how do you make it productive when you're at home since it's not a, a, a traditional office? 
Sarah, you can take that first if you want. So I, I make sure that I have a space, my main space that um, I have everything set up and I work from, um, but I also, I, I have a laptop. I, there are just some days just moving to a different space, to a different room. Um, I find myself more productive. It's just the same thing. I mean, pre COVID, um, going to a cafe. Um, it's amazing that I can get so much work done, um, on the days that I decide to, you know, go to a coffee shop, um, just a little change of space really is helpful for me but I do have that one dedicated space where I have everything set up and I have everything I need and my printer and everything um so I, I do have I, I do have some order um but really I mean I I've been in different apartments while while um working remotely and my first report apartment what I, I had a small space and it just I you know I just made it work. The remain organ organization I'm sure is key. What about you Lori? So um, I know I said 88% of our uh, organization work remotely but I am that weird millennial that hates it <laughs> and I've always hated it. Um, I really like structure. Um, I like like my gym is close to work. I like to be able to go to work, go to the gym, like have that structure my day. Um, and so working from home is definitely a challenge for me. Um, I do have a space right now. I'm in a basement and I'm someone who needs windows too. So I, I'm not that person who just sits in one space all day long. I kind of gravitate um, depending on what project I'm doing and it, it's working. Um, but definitely uh, this has been a change. Mm -hmm. I know for me, um, I try to have zero distractions when all, if at all possible. I want to have some sunlight. Um, and I, I'm a very much a minimalist. I don't like to have papers. I, I have one pad and my laptop, my additional screen. I Even in my office at work, you'll never see a paper on my desk and people think I'm not doing any work because I don't have chaos going on. Uh, but for me, it is all about um, no distractions. Although I, you know, I'm home and, and I have an eight month old son and his bedroom is right next door. So when he's midway through a nap or he's crying or I hear him downstairs having way more fun than I am, um, it is it is a, a challenge, but I think the space makes makes a big difference. I do want to also mention, um, you know, a change of atmosphere is it, it really does it really can uh, spark creativity and and productivity. Um, I've been to some office spaces where you have your laptop at your desk, but you can go to the kitchen, you can go to a, a lobby, a lounge, and you can just move around. And there's bean bags at Member Clicks. If you've ever been to the Member Clicks office, you know there's there's a uh, different spaces for, for different parts of your brain to work properly. So I definitely understand that. I'm going to go to the, to the Q and a here, or did you want to say something, Greg? You're muted, Greg. Yeah, I was looking, I was fighting with whoever was keeping muting me. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, if you are working in a shared space, um, you know, you don't have a dedicated room, make sure that you have a box or a, a crate or something so that you can put your work stuff away at the end of the day. You, you know, uh, uh, go ahead and, and do that. Uh, the second, if you're working virtually, um, really make Zoom backgrounds your friend if you can. You know, it's, it's amazing how different it, it feels if all of a sudden there's, you know, um, water behind you, running water or something like that. Um, and then last, sort of have fun with it. This is something that my daughter made for me to hang on the door. I have an idea, go away. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> I should have that up on my door right now to let them know that I'm doing a conference call. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, have some fun with it. Um, yeah. Fun, tr fun trivia fact. Um, that cat, Grumpy Cat, its real name is Tartar Sauce. I always thought that was a great name for a cat. Hey, did you have something to add? Yeah, uh, I, I just saw flying through the chat a bunch of people asking how to unplug. Um, and I think that's a really big part of this conversation too. <clears throat> a couple of things that work for me. Um, I'm quarantined with a friend. Uh, so we hold each other accountable. Um, and we have accountability buddies in that 
we make plans for what we're doing after work that day. And that plan is we're going to cook dinner together. We're going to have a happy hour, which is like a glass of wine and some snacks. And we're going to find something on TV. We're going to go for a walk. Um, and when that time comes, my friend walks into my, my virtual remote office area and says, Hey, it's time to do that thing. We agreed we were going to do. And they keep you accountable and they make you unplug and walk away and close the laptop and, and go do something that refreshes yourself. Um, the other thing that I, I think is important, which, um, I've seen some people say in the chat too, is remember that you have PTO and that PTO can be really, really valuable even at home. Um, you can binge watch something on Netflix or you can spend the entire day doing yoga or you can, you know, do something that has nothing to do with work because that, that PTO, that paid time off is there for your health and well-being. Um, and you would use it if you needed to go to a doctor's office. So use it to take care of your, your mental health too. The last thing I'll say is schedule creep. Uh, in the DC area, traffic is crazy. So I usually leave 45 minutes early uh, before I start work to get to my office but I like to keep on the same sleeping pattern. So that means I'm getting up at the same time I would in order to prepare myself and then commute to work. But I would just get up, grab my coffee and then start working right away. And now I'm working an extra 45 minutes in the morning that I wasn't working before because I'm now working through my commute. And it's really important that we stop doing that and we don't do that. Um, you know, you get out of the office at 4.30 because you don't want to get stuck in the five o'clock traffic. Close the laptop at 4.30, pretend you have to commute. Don't let your schedule your work schedule will creep into the other parts of your life. So those things have helped keep me energized and helped me remind myself that work is important. Work has to get done, but work will also be there again tomorrow when you open your laptop. You know, Nate, in the chat, a lot of people are having major difficulty with that. Um, how can you, how can you uh, break away from the computer and, and you have nowhere to go and your boss knows you have nowhere to go. Um, you, how, you should be available and how, how can you not answer that email that came in after hours but um, setting those boundaries I think is very important um, you know I, for a long time I had a Google voice number that was the only uh, phone number I would give to any of my members so that I could turn the Google voice off and not answer for, uh, text after a certain time and you have to set that expectation I love the idea of taking PTO I think that's very important both during or or uh, during remote work or working in the office. So um, I want to take some of these, uh, the actual questions that came in through the Q&A. Um, how have you improved managing your time work from working from home, which is really what we've been touching on, especially, um, and this goes to your, to your point, Nate, when uh, you're used to working late and your team are early risers. So, uh, you know, to me, I feel like this is focusing on the deliverables versus the, versus the time at your desk. Uh, but any thoughts there from anyone? I can comment on that. Um, I think Greg touched on it a little bit as well, uh, setting expectations um, and sort of all buying into the exact same culture. So when I email my team uh, with a task or a project, I ask them when they have some time to get to it. And I set some expectations around when I would want to see those results. Um, on the flip side of that, it's also really important if you're sending a team member or a colleague a task or a question or a project to say, hey, this really is not top priority. Get to it whenever you want. Don't think because it's an email in your inbox that it has to go immediately onto your to-do list. And I think a lot of us get in this habit of using our inbox as a to-do list and it, that should really be a separate management tool. So really clear communication, really clear expectation setting. Um, and then that grace to just understand that sort of we're all in this very nebulous environment and time and space are these, you know, odd constructs that sometimes don't exist right now. So putting some lines and some guardrails around those are really helpful for me. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, uh, two things. One, we probably all should work at uh, shortening up our meetings. Um, you know, I think it's so natural for us to schedule meetings for half an hour and for an hour, uh, but that leaves us no time to uh, stretch our legs or get a glass of water or do whatever we need to before our next half hour or hour meeting. <laughs> so if, if you can make things 20 minutes, if you can make things 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I put in the chat that I use Calendly to um, manage my schedule with, with others, and it has built in how many uh, meetings I'll take uh, on a certain day and how much time, you know, to put in between the, the space. Uh, I think the second is, is if you're the employee and you're receiving that email and your boss hasn't said, you know, to you, um, 
that this isn't a priority or uh, you know hasn't given you a, a deadline, feel free to ask back. You know, would it be okay if I got this to you next Monday? <laughs> you know, and they, there's a joke about consultants that you should always double your rate. Um, you know, if you're looking to do a project, go ahead and give yourself an extra day or two, you know, to do it. Um, if they need it sooner, they'll let you know and they'll let you know why. Uh, and then you'll feel better about how you juggle your schedule. Thank you. So a couple of the questions that uh, came in the Q&A are about incentivizing staff to unplug, boosting morale, um, and team building activity. So I, I can answer a couple of those myself, just in terms of, I have a team of 13 that I manage and I work for an AMC. So there's a lot of associations that are, uh, we're accountable to, um, but we do happy hours, which you probably heard before, but we, we've actually incorporated playing games during them. So uh, one week uh, we did a, a slideshow of baby pictures of people and you had to try to guess and it actually was a competition who, you know, what that baby picture was. Um, I ended up winning. I'm very good at that for some reason. Um, uh, the next week we did uh, Wheel of Fortune, which sounds strange, but we downloaded a Wheel of Fortune template from Etsy and we're actually able to play Wheel of Fortune with Teams uh, through Zoom. And then we would have people on Microsoft Teams, uh, you know, trying to guess the words. We did the same thing with Family Feud, uh, which was really fun as well. Um, but I think that's just a way to build culture. Um, but does anyone have any ideas about incentivizing staff to you know, unplug at a certain time or to take their PTO? So on Fridays, um, I have a meeting with uh, my road staff uh, you have to have done for, for some time. And we always end that uh, meeting with the uh, question of what people are doing over the weekend. Um, you know, and we always begin Monday morning with, uh, what did you do, <laughs> you know, over the, over the weekend? Uh, and so I think it's really important that at least we protect the weekend. Uh, the second is, is for me, um, even though we have people operating in, in different time zones, uh, I typically consider the workday to be over at 4 p.m. Eastern. It's not that I don't do work beyond that. It's that I'm not going to ask my staff to be in a, in a meeting or to respond to an email um, after that because uh, you know people have to begin to uh, wind down and, and manage their day the way that they need to. Yeah. So I want to, we're about Stop. 15 minutes left. Um, sorry, Nate, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, we have, there's a lot of chatter. I hope all of you are sharing um, in the chat and learning from one another, um, which I, Seems like we are, so I'm really glad to see that. Um, I wanted to just make sure, from the young professionals' perspective, you know, what are we doing now? You know, we're going to start to trickle back into work over the next couple of weeks, and is it going to look different? Is it going to feel different? Are we going to be requesting to work from home because we've proven we can be productive? Um, you know, where do we go from here? So I want to open that back up to the panelists, and Nate, I'll start with you, just going back through the through the list. You know, what, what do you see our next steps as in terms of young professionals and how we can you know, be the experts or, or resources for this new normal that we're going into? I think remote taught us to look at the humanity of all of us, um, especially in a crisis. And I would really like to hope that even when we go back to an office, we're going to remember that. We're going to remember the individuality that we all have. Um, and we're going to respect each other's differences and sort of what our work preferences are. Um, you know, I think the barriers have been broken down for us to have conversations like, hey, I really don't work well in large group meetings with tons and tons of task lists on agenda items. Can we meet one on one? Uh, I really don't prefer structured meeting setups. I would love to just be able to pop into your office and ask you some questions. Is that OK? Um, you know, I, I love face to face contact. I would rather do this over a Zoom or, or in a one-on-one -on -one rather than a phone call or an email. Understanding that we all have preferences that lead to better productivity for all of us, I hope is something that we continue to work toward even in a face-to-face -face office environment. The other thing is I hope we really understand that people have lives outside of work and those lives enrich us. They make us better at what we do um, and they're really important. And the whole check your s at the door when you get to work and, and the old mindset of sort of leave all the all that's at home at home um, when you come to work that can be helpful if, if you're trying to escape some other stuff in your life and you need work to be a release for that 
but it can also be really helpful to bring that stuff to work and to talk about the excitement you have about your weekend or your family or the hobbies you have or the things that you're doing and really rehumanize our coworkers um, for ourselves and for each other. Yeah, make sure you put your pets and your babies and your kids in your in your your line of vision at times, so that yeah. other people can can see that you're not you're not just the person you are at work. You know, helping to humanize I think is really important. Um, uh, uh, Lori, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of nervous about going back. I will say again, I manage a bunch of millennials, and they have taken this seriously from day one. So. No matter what we saw in the news early on, um, truly millennials, like at least on my team, they, they follow the data, they follow the science. Um, and even before we had a typical shutdown in Chicago, they were like, I don't want to come to work. I don't feel safe coming to work. So I really can see that there's going to be some hesitancy when we go back. Um, but I think this time has taught me, at least as a manager, to it's built trust. Um, I really enjoy seeing people in their homes, like not in a weird, creepy way, but I, I, I like to see our execs in their homes and I like to see my colleagues in their homes. And I think it's built this kind of um, different relationship during this time. So um, as a manager, if they didn't feel comfortable coming back, I think now that I would have the trust to say, you know, you've definitely proved that you can do it. Um, whatever you feel comfortable, whatever modified schedule you want, I would be okay with that. If you're hiring, I mean, <laughs> I love that flexible schedule. Uh, Sarah, why don't you take the next? Sure. Um, well, I, I've heard different people say, oh, I, I want to stay remote forever. Or I've heard people say, oh, this is terrible. I never want to work remote again. Um, but one thing that I've learned working remotely is that Everyone has their own work style. Just like everyone has their own learning style, everyone learns differently, everyone works differently. Um, just like Nate said, you know, some people need certain things, some people like to be in an office, some people need uh, complete silence, some people need to have um, music in the background, whatever. And as a young professional, I think it's super important to learn what your work style is because going forward from here, when you're looking for your next position and positions after, if you know your work style, you're gonna be able to look at the association you're applying for and see if their work culture fits your work style. And you're gonna be able to have an open conversation, um, an honest conversation with um, you know, your new supervisor and say, this is my work style, how can we make this work? So if you know that now as a young professional, that's going to set you up for greater success than um, if, if you're not sure. So really, uh, if working remote is something that you think right now you want to do, really think about it because it really isn't for everyone. Um, and it also isn't right for every association. So um, going back, um, take time and think about it. If it's something you want to do, maybe you can work it out with your supervisor that you're able to do it a couple times a day. I mean, a couple times a week um, and see if post COVID that still makes sense for you. That's a great point, Sarah. I have, uh, you know, I've said this to a number of, of individuals I mentor and other young professionals, you know, your, your work style should should be yours and if an organization does not match your work style you probably shouldn't work there and oftentimes we go into interviews in in a in a desperation mode or in a begging mode i really want you to hire me but they should want to hire you and you should want to work there just as much yeah. and so i think you know looking at this remote possibility and sarah and i spoke yesterday when she applied for her job it wasn't a remote job she was planning on moving to dc for the job and they said oh you live in philadelphia we can just make it remote. So she was, you know, sort of thrown on her and, and um, you know, she embraced it. And, you know, four years later, she's still there. Um, but I think it's really important that, that you know, you, you, t you really understand your work style. And if you haven't discovered what your style is yet, really start try to think about it, maybe work with an executive coach or something, and, um, and then really determine if an organization fits your style. Greg, do you want to take, take it next? 
Sure. Uh, you know, I think that what we're learning is something that is very much at the heart of um, progressive corporate management as well. And that's that the employee experience is key to delivering a strong member experience or, or customer experience. You know, um, thinking about how you create an open and engaging culture, it, it, the tactic for how you do that is different. Uh, whether it's in person or, or online, but the values and the commitments, uh, I think it is really bringing back humanity. You know, how do we recognize people? Uh, it's important that we accomplish the work and we all should agree on what goals we want to accomplish, but uh, it's more important that we uh, support our team to make that happen, whether that is working remotely or uh, working in person or traveling or not traveling. Um, and I just would like to add, you know, uh, in terms of people who are thinking about remote and how it might fit into their career path, um, you know, three of the staff that, that I have um, are remote employees that uh, wouldn't have had a, a strong association employment opportunities in the cities that they live in. You know, so it's a benefit for, for them but on the flip side for us, we're able to get um, highly motivated, highly qualified staff uh, that uh, work well, you know, for us. So uh, uh, I do think that for a lot of people, it's, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and for everyone, it's something that you should be prepared for in case something like this happens, you know, pandemic happens. Thanks, Greg. I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're probably an exception, but I, I think most of the, you know, the boomers and the Gen Xers that are the ones making these decisions right now um, still have this view, if you're not in your seat, you're not making me money or you're, you're not, you're not you know, um, performing. And so I really do hope and I think perhaps that this pandemic has really taught them a lesson um, and, and sort of forced their thinking into, to, to pivot to something new um, and be, at least be open. Um, you know, I think, I think what you just said is something I'm going to start using and the employee experience equates to the member experience. So if your member, if your employees just feel like they're, they're, they're a means to an end, that, that, that member's not gonna feel, um, they're not gonna feel the love from the association. So I, I, I know I take that very seriously. And you know, especially in an AMC model, if any of you work in an AMC, you know, they're all, you're always trying to do a lot with very little staff and um, you know the resources um, can be limited at times, so I know how that how that is, and and what I'm living you know day to day. Yeah. So it's it's just interesting. So I I appreciate I appreciate you, Greg. I appreciate you, Tom. <laughs> um. So the the one thing I just wanted to just uh, end on, uh, perhaps since we are, we have about five minutes left, although the chat is very very busy, um, I would hate to cut it off, but I I have ideas of where this chat could continue. But um, this concept I kept seeing is, is a, a concept of guilt and that we feel bad if we are not at our computers or answering emails at, at a specific time. Um, and, and we feel as though we have something extra to prove because we are home. And so I really do hope that this whole situation really shows us that prioritization is very important. Um, there are probably some things that, that are watered down services that our associations offer that probably are not worth it any longer. Um, we're all likely going to feel some financial pinch at our associations. And so how are we going to be strategic about where we're using our resources and where we're using our staff? And, and I really do think uh, the technology piece that Lori mentioned, millennials tend to just have a, a more natural organic understanding of technology. And so if any of you have been in next gen, you, you know Shelly Alcorn, and she thinks robots are going to take over our jobs in very short order, which, you know, I, I, don't, I don't disbelieve, but perhaps, you know, our familiarity with, uh, with technology and how we coped during COVID is likely going to come up in an interview in the future in your, in your career uh, development. And so I really think it's something that you should really think about now and how you're going to formulate your answer um, when, when those questions come up. So, I really do want to thank all the panelists today. I think you all brought a very important piece to the conversation. Again, there's a lot going on in the chat. So what I want to say is, like, very likely you're all young professionals, and even if you're not, you're, you're here for a reason because you wanted to hear all this. So we obviously have our Young Professionals uh, Committee, at our Young Professionals Advisory Committee at ASAE. 
which uh, Lori serves on, and uh, Nate is actually the, the incoming vice chair for. And um, the, the uh, current uh, volunteer deadline has already uh, passed. So if you've applied, I know some of your names, so you applied, so thank you for being here. Um, and we will obviously look at your applications, but you know, there are, there are other opportunities to get involved. We have an ad hoc volunteer list where we can look to you for subject matter expertise, which is how Sarah came, came to us for this panel. And uh, it's, we, we like to get our messages out. So even if you're not on the committee, we certainly want to um, engage with you in one way or another. We have a lot of social media presence, which Lori actually manages for us, uh, the Young Professionals community. I just gave a little plug in the chat. Oh, okay. Follow us. Yeah, we have a lot of really great information. So Young Professional, Amy, is 35 and under, um, to answer your question, which I just saw in the chat. Um, but it really, you know, we like to focus more on talent and keeping talent in the association space uh, versus really the age because everyone really touches a different part of association management. So um, really, if you're new to the association industry, we would love to, to talk to you so that we can help you stay in the association industry and keep, uh, keep your talents here. Um, so lots on social. Um, we, are, we have a Twitter, we have a, an Instagram, and we have a, a Facebook. Uh, but also on Facebook, there's a, a group for young association professionals, which is um, not our ASAEYP, but it's another place the young association professionals uh, do coalesce. And, um, you know, once we start meeting in person again, we have uh, the ASAE Next Gen program is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, so I really do uh, encourage those of you that um, can apply and have the, have the support of your organizations to apply for that. Um, I have no idea what's going on this year with it in September, but um, we all know how things are are uh, transpiring with meetings in 2020. So um, Tom, thank collaborate you. too. Yes, collaborate. Thank you. Uh, we have our community on collaborate, the young professionals community on collaborate, which I think um, you know there's a lot of audience uh, members that might not participate on collab on the young professionals community on collaborate, but they are CEOs or there are other um, you know other managers and, and C-suite executives that you know, they monitor that, so they really want to see what's happening, and and I think that. Uh, that's one of the main reasons that we were brought on to this town hall uh, format because they're, uh, you know, we're, we're being heard right now. And so I really do appreciate that of ASAE. Um, so thank you. Thank you again. I'm going to just pass it to Heidi for a couple of closing remarks. Uh, again, this is recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again if you, if you need. Um, and uh, we hope to talk to all of you on Collaborate or any of our social media platforms. Thank you so much. Heidi? Thanks, Tom, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their experiences and perspectives with the group. As Tom said, this webcast is recorded and it's going to be posted on the website on our issue roundup page. So if you go to ASECenter.org, at the top, you'll see an option to click issue roundup and then it'll take you to all of our um, recorded COVID-19 webcasts. Um, this is part of an ongoing series of dialogues. The next CEO dialogue is Thursday, May 21st at 3.30 Eastern time, and it's called Leading During Crisis and Uncertainty, and registration is live. And if you have any additional topic ideas, please send them to learning at ASCECenter.org. Thank you, everyone, for your time today, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.